Uh, yeah, well, so, common, like Steve Jobs always used to say, it's just common sense. But really, he had a, a sensibility about what people wanted was more important. What they would buy and what they wouldn't, and what was worth so much and what wasn't worth that much, and which engineers to believe and all that. How much did you get involved in that kind of marketing for the customer? Yeah, um, well, marketing for the customer is something I very much believed in. Mike Markla, our angel investor, is really the one who taught us. He said, marketing, how the product looks, how you present your company image, here are how you have to present yourself to the world. He's really the one that gave even Apple the way that Steve Jobs would really learn it from him. That's how you've got to present yourself, and all, things, all these things are very important. Um, but now, myself, I didn't get involved because on day one, we started this company, and, and every little issue that was coming up, should we have the box blue or red? Steve Jobs would, would try to argue it because that was his way of learning in those days. Young, you know, 21-year-old, you just, um, you just challenge everything, and then eventually, and, and he, he liked people to challenge him too and learn from that. And I just sat there thinking, I don't know whether you should sell it you know, in a red box or a blue box, or you should have the engineer do the testing or a different group do the testing. I don't really care because there are people that have done this for 10, 20 years, and they know how to do this. I just know how to do my engineering. I'm going to keep my mouth shut and be thought an idiot rather than open and leave no doubt. <laughs> nobody can ever challenge me at the engineering, so I took the safe way out and avoided all the, I don't like politics. I don't like conflict. and So I avoided a lot of the, the business ends of that company. You know, when I had my own startups, I, I had to do it a bit, but... Yes, you crossed over, right? So. <laughs> well, a, a bit, yeah. Yeah. Um, so changing topics a little bit, uh, you've definitely taken a strong interest in our education system. Um, where do you see it evolving from here, and what should happen for it to be the best? Yeah, I had a goal when I was young to be an engineer first and a teacher second. I told my dad that, and a fifth grade teacher. And it stuck with me my whole life, and in all my psychology classes, I paid attention to development of the human mind, cognitive development, and things like that. And almost got my degree in psychology instead of um, engineering. And eventually, I, mean, I had kids, and I had money. And when you have money in, in, the, in Silicon Valley, it was the days when schools were getting their first networks of computers, a computer room, a lab. So of course, I'm giving computers to the schools. And then I thought, you know, if you're giving stuff money, that's nothing. That really doesn't have meaning. You give what's valuable to you, you sacrifice, you give your own time. So then I started teaching, not knowing if I could, and I decided what I would teach was based on a, a teacher who had won Apple's top teacher award year after year after year in Pittsburgh. And I said, how can you use the computer for every single subject you have in school to present it, to display it, to communicate the answers, and whether it's just writing a report or showing a timeline for history, doing some graphics and all that. And so I went in, I started just teaching that, and that was my goal. I would teach a 200-hour course for one in one year. It was voluntary after school. Take every subject you have in school, present it well, make, learn how to make it look good on your computer, learn how to own a computer, learn how to repair a computer, learn how to understand some of the computer error messages. Now, I wasn't teaching how to be a computer geek like me, um, just how to use it in normal life. And I did that. It was very important to me. But I did learn a lot, and I saw a lot that kids, at first I thought computers coming to schools are going to make kids so much smarter. In our homebrew computer club, they were t the Stanford professors were talking about that idea. Wow, I tried to communicate it to Steve Jobs, and believe it or not, he wasn't listening to me in those startup days. Um, I was telling him they were going to increase our communication and our education, and the geek was going to be important. No, he just wanted a way to get money at first. And, uh, I, and I begged him to sell the first Apple One we ever built to this woman who took computers into elementary schools. And he wouldn't do it, so I had to buy it for 300 bucks and give it to her. <laughs> but I believed so strongly in education, like I did in humor. That was what I was going to devote a lot of my life to. And when I was teaching, I kept thinking, man, I thought these computers were really going to make people smarter. And I didn't see people coming out of like high school smarter and I, than they ever were. I didn't see them learning more. And so I went back and came up with a lot of ideas that you can't start say, oh, we need some new device into the existing education system. The system is, is just flawed because it forces you to learn at the same rate as everyone else, the same subjects, and the right answer is the same answer as everyone else. It's not your answer. And you know what? I got, when I got excited about computer subjects in the university, I would buy every manual I could in, in the, the bookstore, and I'd go through the books and be halfway through answering every question by the time class started on Monday. I loved it. My passion drove me. A kid that gets passionate about some subject doesn't have that ability, the way schools are organized, to, wow, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to learn so much more than anyone else. 
it's very very limited. So computers didn't really um, help us much. They were just more a, a, a nice, fun notebook, and that's where we are now. And I'm thinking, what does it take? You need sort of a human guide. Every young person needs some kind of guide. They really are going into unchallenged new territories and don't know how to get there. And you need that human guide, and a computer doesn't quite do that alone on the internet. Now, now some people are like me. They don't need other humans. All they need is their machine. But not, not very many of them. And they go online and get all the education they want and all this. But really, you want a guide that takes you in certain directions. And I want to see a computer someday be that guide. Be your best friend, be conscious, because we're now talking to our machines and they're talking back and they're becoming like friends and we're falling in love with them the way we fall in love with people, you know, the same, the same mental and, and physical measurements they are, they're, they're saying are kind of like real love. So I, I think someday when computers get to that level of really knowing you, your heart, your soul, better than anyone else, and they, they know your family, they, they know when to, you're watching your face, you know, when uh, time to relax and tell a little joke or let you rest today. Do something. They'll know you like a friend. I, that, that could possibly be a guide, one teacher per student. Class size was the most important thing. And in California, of course, we're 50th in the nation, well below Mississippi. Um, has to do with, has to do with a proposition that was passed some years back. And we could have elections to give more money to schools. Because you think money's going to solve the problem? You know, it's like thinking, if I had a computer that was a thousand times faster, it would solve a lot more problems. It turns out that those problems only get solved because human intuition knows how to solve them. The computers can't do that yet. And the money, for, we, so we had an election in Cupertino, where Apple is located. We have, we're well known for top education, you know, for going back 50 years. Schools have a reputation. So I paid the expense to mail postcards to everybody in Cupertino to vote for, for paying a little more property tax, and we, we got 64% of the vote, and it failed, because Proposition 13 said you needed two-thirds of the vote. Oh. So I paid the expense the next year for the same thing, and we got 64% of the vote, and failed, and then I did it in my town, Los Gatos, we passed it, and then Cupertino passed it. So those two communities had a little bit more money, and what do I see 20 years later? Fancy buildings, renovated buildings, new stadiums, I can't, I can't really pin it down to some big improvement in how smart the people are. Although I'll tell you that Cupertino schools, uh, a couple of those public high schools, are in the top 25 list in the country for SAT scores and all. But, but that's only because that's only because Silicon Valley attracts a lot of certain kinds of very very smart people from Asia. Um, we are now one of 10 counties in the United States where more than half the people speak non-English. You know, very, very smart people come from India and all that, and they become our doctors and our dentists, and that's what it's like. Multicultural. I like to joke, I grew up when it was even more multicultural. My elementary school was in Los Altos, my, my middle school was in Sunnyvale, and my high school was in Cupertino. <laughs> but it was, it was so, so um, everybody the same. Yeah.